Good morning. I'm Russell Myers, CEO of Midland Health, and this is our coronavirus update for Thursday, July 2nd, 2020. I'll start this morning with some data. The uh, state of Texas has now over 168,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases. There have been 2,481 deaths in the state. In Midland County, we passed the 700 mark yesterday. We're at uh, 701 confirmed cases and 15 deaths have occurred uh, among Midland County residents. Uh, testing, I'll, I'll talk a lot more about that in a minute, but, but as of now, the testing that the hospital uh, is doing at our testing site uh, has become increasingly challenging. Uh, we're, we're getting lots of tests done, uh, but we're not getting the results back timely. Uh, it's uh, Thursday, we still have at least one uh, result outstanding from last Tuesday. Uh, the labs across the uh, country are getting overwhelmed with the volume of testing that they're being asked to do, and we're seeing the impact of that. Uh, more on that in just a second. Uh, in the hospital today, there's 172 patients. Uh, we have uh, 10 patients in the regular critical care beds, five in the COVID critical care unit, and 17 in the COVID medical unit for a total of 22 COVID patients, nine patients on ventilators, uh, four of those are COVID patients. Uh, and in the emergency department, we saw 124 patients yesterday. That's still about 30% less than at the same time last year. Um, so things continue uh, to be concerning, especially as we go into a holiday weekend. More on that in just a moment. Um, we talked about uh, remdesivir access uh, last time we, uh, we spoke. Uh, we were hoping that we may get an allocation coming soon. Has anybody heard? We we're hoping to hear about a new allocation uh, in the next day or two, uh, but as of this moment have not. So we do not have any remdesivir available to patients uh, right at this moment. Our doctors continue to have access to convalescent plasma, uh, which we believe has been beneficial uh, and will continue uh, likely to be used on patients who, for whom it's indicated. Um, we have an increasing number of employees testing positive, as we're seeing across the community. Uh, the working population, working age people are, are inc increasingly testing positive. Uh, that's true of our workforce as well, scattered across the entire, uh, entire organization. And as we continue to see a high census, uh, obviously that becomes a concern for us. Our employee health team is on top of that. Um, uh, testing employees, sending them home to isolate, uh, monitoring them while they are isolated, only allowing them to return to work when their, their recovery is confirmed. Uh, but that is a, a growing concern for us uh, that we're losing people from the workforce, at least for, for short periods of time. Uh, hospital capacity uh, is, is improving a little bit. Uh, even though our census is high, we have had a number of beds blocked. Uh, we have an ongoing construction project on the ninth floor of the Scarborough Tower. Uh, hoping to get some new beds available uh, in the by the fall, uh, and some of that work affects the beds on the eighth floor, which are actively in use. Uh, on Monday, we expect to return five of those beds to to full capacity, uh, and so that will help. There will only be a handful of beds left that are not available uh, as we finish up that element of the construction project. Uh, accordingly. Uh, we are, uh, we're talking to our surgeons. We've had very cooperative relationships with them uh, throughout this process. For the most part, elective surgery is going forward uh, as scheduled. Uh, we have been in contact with the surgeons and asked them to defer inpatient elective cases that appear to need multiple, stay, multiple day stays uh, in the inpatient environment. Uh, and as the next week unfolds, we've asked our surgeons to, to carefully begin scheduling those cases again. Uh, we'll be in daily dialogue with them about how many are appropriate. Uh, and, and so far, that's been, that's been handled very successfully, uh, as, as has been the case throughout. Our surgeons and our anesthesiologists and our leadership team have worked very well together uh, to try to balance the need to get elective surgeries done with the requirement to keep some beds available and assure that we don't overwhelm our capacity so that the COVID population can be properly cared for. So that will be a work in progress. Uh, as I said, most elective surgeries are going forward as normal. Uh, those that require an inpatient stay, especially a multiple day inpatient stay, 
uh, we're handling cautiously, but expect to do some of those beginning next week. Uh, now I want to talk about testing a little bit. Uh, as, as I told you earlier, we are experiencing extended delays now in, in the resulting of send out testing. Uh, we're testing more and more people every day, uh, but the results are not coming back as timely as we would like. In the meantime, uh, we are working hard to get some additional testing sites established. Um, we've been working on that all this week uh, and, and continue to find logistical technology, personnel challenges that we have to overcome. Uh, we don't have an abundance of extra people around. We have to acquire some new technology to make, the, to make an additional site work. Uh, all that is coming together. And I'm very hopeful that by the middle of next week, uh, there's a good chance that we'll have a second testing site uh, live and we'll be able to tell you uh, about that. As we work on the, the new testing capacity, we're not anticipating a change in the, the rules. Today, uh, you call 68Nurse or you get an order from your physician uh, and you make an appointment to come and be tested in our testing site. As we add additional capacity, those expectations will be the same. Uh, we're working now to add new phone lines, new technology to manage more calls, uh, to, to deal with the record demand that we're seeing in 6-8 Nurse right now, uh, hoping to have that uh, available early next week as well. So as the new testing site comes on and more demand for testing is realized that our 6-8 Nurse lines are ready to handle that. Um, hopeful of getting that set up pretty quickly. Uh, let's see. Uh, rapid testing is a part of that as well. Uh, we have identified a, a, a rapid testing machine uh, and have several of them now available to us as well as test kits uh, in, in a reasonable quantity to get started uh, and some assurance from the manufacturer that those kits will be able to continue to be manufactured and provided to us in the future. Uh, those machines uh, have about a 15 minute turnaround, uh, conceivably even less than that. So we're hopeful that as we set up new sites, uh, we can continue to see fairly good turnaround on the swabbing and the running of the tests uh, and deliver test results to patients the same day versus five or six days later that we're experiencing now. That's, uh, none of that's easy. Uh, when you acquire a new piece of laboratory equipment, it's gotta be validated. People have to be trained to use it. We have to be prepared to put its results into an electronic medical record and report those not only to the patient and the patient's physician, but also to the state and to the federal government. Uh, a whole lot of hurdles that have to be overcome to set up a new testing site. But we're encouraged. Uh, most of those things are coming together and we're hopeful, as I said, about the middle of next week. A, a big part of this, uh, which we're, uh, for which we're very appreciative, uh, is cooperation from city and county emergency management folks. Uh, setting up a new site uh, outdoors primarily uh, requires some support, uh, an air conditioned trailer for the staff and for the supplies, uh, a drive up uh, area that can be managed uh, carefully uh, and, and assure the patients don't have to come inside a building uh, to get tested. All those things are coming together nicely and next week uh, we hope to be able to tell you exactly how it's all gonna work and where um, but we're very appreciative of all the cooperation we've had uh, and, and pretty excited about the possibility of getting rapid turnaround testing in place for large quantities of people, um, still people with symptoms or reasons, um, extreme exposures or, or other good reasons to be tested. This is not going to be a walk-in, um, get tested if you want to kind of arrangement, uh, but it will expand our capacity to meet the increasing demand, and we're very hopeful about having that all live next week. I think um, that is all the prepared remarks I have uh, for the moment, and I'll be happy to take questions. We have some questions from Facebook regarding the concern that's out there of people padding positive tests um, for reimbursement or getting paid. Can you address that concern? I've not heard that concern. So the, the question is, are we essentially lying about the, the, the test results? Uh, no, we're not. I, I can speak for our organization. Uh, we, we tell the truth as we know the truth. Uh, positive tests are a concern for us, uh, and they yield patients in the hospital, uh, unfortunately. And I think we said this the other day, Dr. Wilson, 
rightly pointed out that while you know there may be some some concern that it's even um, increased numbers of tests being run are yielding additional positives that's probably part of the truth uh, but the fundamental truth that we're concerned about is how many patients are positive and require hospitalization uh, and those numbers are up and they're staying up so um, I, all i can say is we don't lie we we tell the truth about our results i don't believe anybody else in our community is lying either uh, but regardless of what you believe about that, the numbers of patients in the hospital are going up. The reality is we have a growing concern in our community, and it's yielding people who are very sick and require hospitalization. Another question from Facebook, is Decadron steroids being used to treat people that have positive results? Dr. Wilson and I have talked a good bit about that. I think I'm going to ask him to come up and talk about it. It's uh, it, it's not a straightforward answer, uh, but uh, Larry. Good morning. Thank you, Russell. Um, so the, we had a conference um, conference call yesterday discussing just the Decadron situation, and it's um, it isn't a straightforward answer, but it's pretty clear that there is benefit with steroid therapy, whether Decadron or other steroids in the latter phases of the illness and people that are getting sick from what we're describing as the post-viral inflammatory reaction. The onset of the illness comes on with respiratory tract symptoms, et cetera, and it's related to the virus itself in the system. That virus clears at some point, and while the virus is clearing, there's a rem uh, remnants of the inflama inflammatory process that continue to create problems, and that's where some people get very, very sick. And there appears to be benefit in that population. So very, very sick individuals, generally requiring ventilatory support. There's been evidence that they will benefit from steroid therapy. There is little to no evidence and maybe even potential for harm in using steroid therapy early in the disease for subsets of the population. Now, persons with underlying COPD and other things, that's a physician call on continuing steroid therapy. But... Part of the way that steroids work is to create an immune suppression, and you want an immune response to fight the virus. So we want to temper the blockage of the immune system with the benefits of the post-inflammatory phase, and that's a, a judgment call and, and where they are in the illness, and generally only in hospitalized patients, and generally the, the most well-documented benefit is in those patients requiring um, placement on a ventilator. I guess that's a straightforward answer. It's just not a simple answer. That's uh, probably a better way to phrase it. We have a question from the media. Sammy, go ahead. Hey there, Russell. Hey, Could you touch on uh, a little bit more about those rapid tests? So you got a few more machines, how many exactly? And then you said that you're going to go live with that next week. Um, can you just walk us through the details on the rapid testing? Sure, I can tell you some more. Um, I, how many we have in hand right now, I'm not sure. I think it was three. At my, the last time I heard, we've ordered a couple more. Uh, this is the Quidel Sophia uh, rapid test machine, uh, which we've not had access to until just now. Uh, over the last day or two, I know at least yesterday, we were testing it at one of our clinic sites um, with, with employees and others who were who are going through the process of validating the machines, making sure we know how to run them, making sure the results are reasonably accurate. We've even compared some results against our other testing methodologies to make sure that, that we feel good about the results we're getting. So those are, are now being worked through. We've got a trained staff uh, to operate them in multiple locations. We have to tie them into our electronic medical record. Uh, we have to work out a system for assuring that we accurately register the patients uh, as they come through to make sure we, we know who they are and where they are. And we can get results to them and we can bill their insurance company if, if they have insurance. We won't be asking anybody for upfront payment, no different from what we're doing now, uh, but where it's appropriate, we'll be billing insurance. So we have to be prepared to do all of that. Uh, we do have uh, some shortages of staffing uh, as we're, we're using staff both from the hospital and from premier physicians clinics around the community. Uh, as the recovery has, has occurred, those practices are getting busier. Uh, you heard earlier, we've got uh, a number of staff who have positive tests and are, are out of commission for a while. 
Uh, so putting together just a handful of staff to run these testing sites isn't as simple as, as we would like it to be. Um, so it will take a little time to get that set up. Uh, at least one of the sites will have uh, an outdoor setup. So the, the city is providing us with a trailer. Uh, the county is assisting in that process as well. We'll have a, a carefully orchestrated uh, queuing process and, and a protected environment for the staff as we get set up. Um, we have a uh, um, small number of test kits in hand to run these machines. Uh, and we're expecting a significant uh, uh, order delivery on Monday. Uh, we're uh, understand, hope understandably anxious about that. Uh, in, in many cases during the course of the, of the pandemic, uh, we've had suppliers assure us that they could deliver personal protective equipment or test kits or any number of important items uh, only to find out that we get a fraction of what we ordered when it finally shows up. So we're trying to be careful not to overpromise uh, until we have those test kits at hand and are ready to do them in some quantity. Uh, but the best part about all this is we'll be in control of it once it gets started. Uh, the, the machines will be uh, here on site. Uh, the tests can be run in somewhere between 10 and, and 20 minutes. Uh, and that's part of what we're learning as we're training and, and validating the machines. Uh, and so instead of uh, going to our drive through testing site, uh, getting swabbed and then having to wait a week to get your results, uh, we're hopeful that, that most of the people we test uh, can hang around and get results before they leave or be called within an hour or so uh, after being swabbed uh, with an accurate result. So uh, lots, of, lots of good will come of this. I'm, I'm trying to be very cautious about making promises because, you know, in, like so many other things we've experienced, uh, it's not done until it's done, and we don't want to promise more than we can deliver. But we're very optimistic about uh, having, having a substantial amount of new capacity in multiple locations available next week. And then real fast, just to add, I want to clarify, do you need special access? You know, who gets access to these speedier machines? Sammy, you're kind of cutting in and out there. Did you say who gets access to those tests? Yeah, yeah. who, who would get access to the speedier process? Uh, well, what we hope is that everybody we test will uh, eventually. Uh, we, we're going to phase it in a little bit. Um, so it may be that we have a mix of send out tests and rapid turnaround tests for a little bit. Uh, but by the time it's fully ramped up, we hope that all of the testing we're doing will be done on the rapid tests. Uh, Dr. Wilson was just reminding me that one of the things that, that we all have to be aware of as the, as the tests gets more, get, as the tests get more rapidly delivered, uh, there's a couple of machines on the market that can turn around a five to 15 minute test result. Uh, but you give up a little bit of accuracy. Uh, especially on negatives. So what, what we've understood about this machine, and we validated that a little bit uh, already in our testing, uh, is that while there aren't any false positives, uh, there is the occasional false negative. The accuracy of the machine on the negative side is not perfect. Uh, and so if we have a patient who has symptoms that are significant, and they come and get rapid tested and show up as negative, uh, we'll have a judgment call to make then about whether to either send out their test to a lab where accuracy is virtually 100% or perhaps run it on our in-house machine. Um, those will be judgment calls that will be made uh, at the scene uh, and in conjunction with each patient's doctor. But uh, positives, we know we can rely on. Uh, the negatives with the patient who has symptoms, we'll be a little bit cautious with those. We have a question from Stuart at the MRT. Um, he says, thank you for the work you're doing. Is there a greater percentage of those being tested, testing positive? Uh, yes, uh, the, the percentage of, of those being tested who are turning out to be positive is increasing a little bit. Uh, we've talked about that here recently. But that's, that certainly is the case. We're, we're testing more people and, and a higher percentage of the ones we test are coming up positive. We have another question from the media with MCH not allowing transfers from outside Ector County for at least the next week. Are y'all prepared to handle a potentially greater number of COVID patients from the surrounding rural areas coming into your location? Well, we, we hope that doesn't happen, uh, but we do have a, a plan uh, for a surge uh, and are prepared to manage some additional patients without question. 
uh, with a census of 170 plus uh, and 22 COVID patients, uh, we're getting close to needing to move into the next phase of our surge plan. Uh, and so we'll, we'll be prepared to do that if we have to. I think the bigger concern here uh, is not space, but staff, uh, as it has been all along. Uh, we are in the summer months. This is the time of year when our staffing models show us at our lowest inpatient census. So our basic fundamental staffing model has the fewest number of nurses available right now of any time during the year. Uh, we're staffing up where we can. We've got uh, some, some uh, conversations going on with traveling nurse agencies, uh, but this is not an easy time to staff uh, a big growth in the inpatient census. Uh, and it's particularly difficult when we have a number of people who are out with COVID positive diagnoses themselves. Uh, so, so the short answer is yes, we are prepared to help in the region. Uh, that, that ability to help is not unlimited, uh, but we do have a couple more stages of surge capacity that we can put online uh, if and when we need to. We have another question for Stuart. How many staffers have tested positive? Uh, the last count I heard was 41. We have a question from Sammy for Dr. Wilson regarding what about the steroid? I cannot pronounce this. It's on so, the so, okay. Budesonide? 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 Yeah, Budesonide. Okay, yeah. one West Texas doctor believes that this is a silver bullet for COVID-19. Yeah, so budesonide, among other steroid therapies, are inhaled steroids. Um, and the ones that have been shown to be most beneficial per my earlier conversation are um, given either orally or um, through IV. Um, inhaled steroids have not shown any benefit in any of the studies that I'm familiar with. We have another question from Sammy. Just how close are we to the surge plan? Well, we're, we're, we're in it. Uh, we, we started out with, with a single 12-bed um, unit for critical care COVID patients and a single 12-bed unit for medical COVID patients. Uh, we're in the second phase where we've added a second 12-bed unit. Um, I'm looking at Kit, hoping he's going to respond. <laughs> uh, so uh, we, we now have two 12-bed medical units assigned to COVID patients plus one 12-bed critical care unit. The next phase is, uh, you want to come talk about it? Sure. You're, you're, Kit, Kit uh, Bredemus, our chief nursing officer, developed the search plan and, and is much better equipped to talk details than I am. So Kit? Yes, so the uh, next phase would then require us to flip an entire unit similar to what we did with the uh, original uh, increase in nursing home patients when we had to, to do that. So we'd actually convert one of our entire floors uh, at this point and probably be the eighth floor uh, into an entire COVID unit. But again, it's gonna depend on the population that we have. So if we have a higher group of medical surgical population or critical care is gonna determine the next pivot point. But uh, either way, when one of those units fills up, we then have to move to an entire floor and, and modify that process. So hope that answers that question. So to, to make that a little simpler, we have 17 medical patients today uh, with a capacity of 24. So obviously if we reach that 24 capacity, we're gonna have to move to the next phase. We have another question from the media. Have any traveling nurses been brought in so far? I believe so. Um, I, I don't know how many. Okay. We have uh, nine that are working now, and we are, are working toward getting another 14. We have a question from Facebook. Do you have any information on long-term physical damage due to COVID infections? You want to try that? Um, I'll let Dr. Wilson try that one. I'm sure uh, many of you have heard of the cases that we've spoken here and, and elsewhere in the news. You've heard about cases uh, that are a little atypical, um, persons with um, uh, vascular um, disease associated with COVID. So certainly a person with a stroke or um, a, a heart attack or other vascular presentations will have long-term consequences 
as a result of that. Specifically with the respiratory tract illness, that post-inflammatory damage that I was speaking about earlier that might respond to steroid therapy and improve with steroid therapy can leave permanent scarring and damage to the lungs as well. The amount of that and what the long-term consequences of that remains to be seen. We're three, three or four months into this now, and we'll see how things play out over the next years. Um, we, we have a lot to learn um, as we go forward with what we've experienced in this pandemic. So thank you. Thank you, Larry. We have a question from Caitlin at the MRT in regards to postponing elective surgeries. What kind of surgeries normally require multiple day stays in the hospital? And is MMH preparing to scale back surgeries further or concern surgeries will need to be canceled again? Um, well, there's several questions there. Unfortunately, they're on the screen, so I can keep up. Um, the, uh, the types of surgeries that require uh, multiple day stays, there's, there's a number of them, but uh, for example, uh, a colon resection might be one. Uh, we've talked this morning about, about bariatric uh, weight loss surgeries. Uh, those will take a two or three day stay. Um, spinal surgeries oftentimes will take longer. Um, you know, those are, those are among the ones that are elective and will require a multiple day stay. Uh, we certainly are still doing emergent cases, uh, those that come up on patients who are really sick and in the hospital and need a surgical um, uh, issue addressed um, to resolve their issue and, and have multiple day stays associated with, the, with them as well. Those are not elective, so those are happening regardless. We're just talking about things where the surgeon has worked up the patient, they're ready to schedule them and get their, their problem solved, um, but in some cases we're asking them to slow those down. Uh, are we concerned about um, scaling back surgeries any more than, than we, uh, what I've described? Uh, certainly we're concerned about it, uh, and that's, that's why we're talking regularly now with our surgeons and our anesthesia providers, just as we were earlier in the year, um, <clears throat> that our ability to continue to do surgery is dependent on a couple of things. Uh, one, our census, you know, if we're full of COVID patients, uh, almost uh, even to the point that we have to take staff who would otherwise be doing surgery or recovery or or endoscopy or one of the other areas and reassign them to inpatient care because we can't keep up, uh, that would be a reason to slow down surgeries. Uh, if we get back into a personal protective equipment crisis, especially if we can't find masks um, and other uh, vital equipment, uh, then we'd have to revisit that again, much like we did back in March and April. Uh, I don't see that on the horizon. Uh, but I, it would be foolish to think that it's not a possibility. Uh, we have to be uh, aware of it and, and stay on top of things and continue to talk to our, our providers every day about what we're all comfortable doing and, and what we have the resources to do. But as of now, um, surgeries, uh, outpatient surgeries are going forward, short stay inpatient surgeries. Uh, we've told our surgeons that, that they can begin again scheduling those elective longer stay cases next week, as long as we're careful and, and minimize the numbers. Um, so I, I think we're in a, a pretty decent equilibrium right now, uh, but we're actively monitoring that every day. Let's see, is there more to that question? More CARES she, funding? Yes, yeah, she has a follow-up question about has MMH received any more in CARES funding or expecting to receive more funding? We, we are actually expecting to receive some more funding, uh, and I'll be able to talk about that uh, closer to uh, our board meetings in July. Um, it's, there's a little bit of uncertainty about the CARES funding even that we've already received and how it's supposed to be allocated. Um, so we, we do expect to get some more. I'm encouraged by that. How much uh, and when uh, remains to be seen. And, and as soon as we know uh, some, some clear detail about that, we'll let you know. We have a question from Facebook. What is the sensitivity and reliability of the testing for COVID and the antibody testing? Um, do you want to take that, Larry? Would you like me to repeat the question? Or okay. The um, as Russell mentioned earlier, um, there's different types of testing that we can do for immediate response to the infection, ongoing infection. And so this is all testing for COVID-19 infections. Um, the PCR test, the one that we're currently sending out that we um, 
and, and some are doing locally as well. The PCR test is very sensitive and specific. Um, it's got a very high reliability of if, if you have a negative test, it's negative. If you have a positive test, it's positive. Several of the rapid tests that are coming on the market now, you trade a little bit of the um, sensitivity uh, for rapidity. So getting the test back quickly. These are antigen-based tests. They're not based on the RNA that comes from the virus, but they're based on proteins that are on the surface of the capsule of the, of the virus. And that's in, therein lies some of the problem with the, with the test. So as Russell mentioned, um, with the rapid, more, more rapid tests, uh, many of the more rapid tests, including the SOFIA-2 that we'll be working with, up to 15 out of 100 tests that are negative may actually be on somebody who is positive for the infection. So you have, there's some care has to be weighed into that. If you're feeling ill, you're having symptoms, you get tested and it's negative, please don't go out with the a certainty that you're doing fine. On the other hand, if you wanna travel and you're doing well, but you have some requirement to have a test before you can travel, it might be a fine test to get quick results to be able to get going without you know, worrying about it. So it's, there's you know, purposes for everything that we do. Um, the antibody testing is a completely different animal that's looking for the body's response to having had the infection. Um, anywhere from five days to weeks after the infection's onset, the body will start producing antibodies that can be measured. Um, there's a large degree of uncertainty about the reliability of antibodies production. Some individuals in some of the larger studies that we've looked at with confirmed infection and recovery measure no antibodies in their system. Uh, what that means in terms of immunity or lack thereof is uncertain. There's a lot of uncertainty, as, as you've heard us say, a lot of unsettledness around this. But so the, the PCR test, the RNA test for COVID-19 is the most sensitive and most specific. The antigen test, which some of the rapid tests are, lose a little bit of that sensitivity. Uh, and the antibody test is a completely different animal looking for recovery from the infection, not for the infection itself. And this, there's uncertainty around what that might mean. And speaking to our infectious disease doctors yesterday about that, there's no use for antibody testing to prove an ongoing infection, nor does it really, do we know anything about whether or not it really means anything about whether you've recovered from the infection or if you've had the infection. So there, there's really, uh, Jury's still out on what the antibody tests are going to do for us going forward, and maybe some better ones will come up. We have another question from Facebook. Are you concerned with the amount of staff members that are quarantining due to community spread? Yes. Um, one of our biggest concerns, actually. Um, it's not shocking that it would be the case. Uh, we don't believe that, that any of these staff have actually gotten it from a COVID-positive patient. Uh, we believe it's being uh, acquired in the community or they traveled or they've been exposed to someone who's, who's positive, uh, perhaps in their family, just like everybody else. I mean, our, our staff live in this community. They, they are active in this community. And just like we're seeing uh, with, with hundreds of new positives, our people are among those. And uh, that's, that's part of our reality. So we're very concerned about it, not only because these people are sick and we, we want to be sure they get good care, but because we rely on them to care for others. And the fewer of them we have, the harder that is to do. Um, so we, we're, we've been, tried to be very diligent throughout the process about educating our staff. We require people to wear masks when they're at work, uh, unless they're by themselves and, and effectively socially distanced. Uh, and we, you know, the emphasis we've placed on it here, I believe people certainly hear and understand, uh, but we're not in control of their behaviors once they leave the hospital. And, they're going to behave just like other people in the community do, and we're going to be uh, at risk for, for having some, some positive staff members. Um, yeah, it's troubling, but, you know, we, we're, we're working with it, and uh, the best thing is that our employee health team is on top of it. Uh, the moment anybody shows any symptoms, we get them tested, we get them out of the workforce, we avoid them exposing anybody else at work, uh, and uh, I think that's being effective, but the numbers are growing. Another question from Facebook, how do we stop the spread? Should mask be mandatory? You know, mandatory is an interesting word. I think for those of us that are paying attention uh, and care about each other and about our community, 
uh, a personal mandate. We, we talk a lot about personal responsibility in our culture here. Uh, and we've recognized for years that uh, top-down behavioral expectations don't work nearly as well as inspired people doing the right thing because it's the right thing, because they have uh, a personal intrinsic motivation to do what's right. Uh, that's what we need in our community. All of us need to recognize we have a personal responsibility uh, to protect each other and protect ourselves, uh, to wash our hands, to avoid crowds, uh, to wear a mask whenever it's possible, especially within when you're not able to socially distance, um, to recognize that when I wear a mask, I'm protecting you. When you wear a mask, you're protecting me. Uh, and to act on that care for our, to be our brother's keeper throughout this, this process. Um, you know, those are those governmental mandates that are, that are driven by the city or the governor or the, or the nation, though no, they're not, uh, but they're likely to be much more effective than those would be, frankly, uh, if we all just buy in and do what's right because it's what's right. If you have had COVID-19, can you get it again? There's been some question about that. Yeah, Dr. Wilson's answered that a few times in our past meetings. And uh, there has been some evidence that there are some relapses. Not, It's not common, uh, but we can't say with certainty that you cannot get it again. Uh, as Dr. Wilson was just talking about antibodies, uh, there's a good bit of, of mystery still surrounding the, the body's production of antibodies, how, how great a concentration does it require to, to achieve immunity. Uh, we, we simply don't really know, but it's not impossible to have a relapse. I believe we've addressed all of the questions at this point. Very good. Well, I appreciate everybody's attention. Uh, we, we will continue to provide briefings. I, I don't think we'll do this on Monday. Uh, coming out of a holiday weekend, I suspect that there will be a lot to, uh, to talk about, uh, but it'll take us a while to, to uh, uh, debrief uh, and, and learn what's going on. So I, I think, Tasa, we'll probably schedule one for Tuesday. Uh, and, and then we'll be able, I hope at that point, to tell you some more details about additional testing capability and, and when that comes online. Uh, I hope I can report that we've added uh, capacity on 6-8 Nurse, which I expect will be the case. Uh, so there should be a good bit of good news to share uh, on Tuesday, along with the results of a holiday weekend. And, and I expect, uh, unless we're all very, very careful and, and thoughtful this weekend, we're likely to have a spike in cases, whether that'll come Monday or a few days after, uh, it's more likely to, to take a few days. But uh, let's let's see if we can't avoid that uh, by remaining, uh, staying home if we can, keeping social distance, wearing a mask, washing your hands, uh, not touching your face, avoiding big crowds. All the things we've been saying from the very beginning are particularly important uh, in these uh, celebration moments like the 4th of July weekend. And the last point I'd like to make, oh, maybe there's another point. We, Sammy has one question. She's asked if she could ask it All one right, last Sammy, time. Okay. okay. Sorry. Yes. Real fast, just because I bet this will be my story for the day. Going back, going back to staff who have tested positive, you said 41, but how many actively um, are quarantining, uh, things like that? How many active cases do you have? I think that's the I think that is the active yeah. number. Yeah, okay. they're, they're, they're at different stages in their quarantine, but yeah, we we Larry's saying we, we may have had one come off the list yesterday. We're we're monitoring them all and they're all on their own schedules, but but uh, that's the total number at, at varying stages. I have two more things I've I've I'm uh, reminded that I need to speak about, uh, and I'll, I'll be brief, but uh, one of the things that we've been particularly encouraged by uh, is the number of, the growing number of businesses locally that are requiring masks and taking a, a stronger stand. That is another piece of that responsibility that, that we can all get behind. Um, I know, you know, the, the HEB policy has been uh, publicized and they've, they've gotten uh, lots of strokes. What, what's really good um, that's happening here in our community is that the MRT is collecting a uh, list of those who are requiring masks and me being very clear about that, recognizing those local companies. 
Um, there were several on the list. I know Dairy Queen was on the list, and, and of course HEB was, and Jumburrito, and Starbucks. Uh, there were a couple of physician practices on the list, and I think it's true of most of our of our uh, clinical locations that they're requiring masks. Uh, I would encourage you to go uh, look at the MRT website. It, I saw it on there this morning. Uh, they're they're doing a great job of recognizing people who are stepping up. Uh, raising expectations and trying to keep their customers safe. Uh, so thank you all for doing that, and and we'll continue to to offer your our, th our thanks and recognition as well uh, as we go through these. Last point: um, vote. Please remember to vote. Uh, we are we are in the early election period now. It started on Monday. We're having large numbers of people vote. Actually, much greater turnout than than I frankly expected uh, this early in the process. Uh, you can vote today at all the early voting sites. You cannot vote tomorrow or Saturday. Uh, they'll be closed for the holiday. Uh, they'll be reopening Sunday afternoon from 1 to 6. And then next week, all week, uh, they'll be on a 7A to 7P schedule at all five early voting sites uh, leading up to Election Day on July 14th. So please don't forget to vote. Well done. Thank you all very much.